this like every week but would you like to ride to church with me oh uh, come on mrs edwards you like my church we have some hot music it may not be what you're bumping at all but it's hot we get you down what do you say mrs edwards oh uh, i suppose I've heard it said that 80% of first-time church visitors come because someone personally invited them. All people need to feel loved and wanted, and for some people, it just takes having someone offer to give them a ride to church. We have something great going on at this church. People's lives are being transformed by God's love. Your homework this week is to find at least one person who could use a little more of that love and invite them to come with you next week. Trust me, it's worth the extra effort. Mrs. Edward, you want to listen to some music on the way? Go ahead, your choice. Okay, here we are. Coming soon. Easter is coming soon. I know I, the, there's from a particular church I saw on the internet. And so we just, uh, I just love that. I love that. Because the first time I saw it, I, I, I thought it was the black dude in the black car bumping that music. And it was just hilarious. Uh, anyway, look, guys, Easter Sunday is on the 31st. Everybody say Easter Sunday. March 31st. All right, we can put the light on now because... The platform is gone, so I'm a little shorter. I need all the light I can use. Uh, so, listen, we are so excited about this coming Easter Sunday, and I believe that God is going to do some great things. We're going to have two services that day. It's going to be identical services, one at 9.30 a.m. and the other at 11 o'clock. For those of you that may have some things that you're planning to do on Easter Sunday, look, I know you're going to your 7, 7.30 Mass or whatever it is, but we have two services. You can come right afterwards. It's going to be uh, an hour and a half or so. It's not going to be that long, and we're going to do whatever it is that we're going to do afterwards, but we'd love to have you come. Amen? Amen. 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 You're ready for Easter Sunday? Amen. Are you all re ready for Easter Sunday? So we got uh, Easter Sunday, March 31st, 9.30 a.m., amen, and 11 o'clock a.m. And for those of you that are here for the very first time, we're just so thankful that you have made it here to, 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 to worship and praise Community Church that are gathering. We are just so excited to have you here. And if this is your first time, we are just, uh, you know, we, we want, let us know that it's your first time. I know we can see your face, but uh, we want to connect with you, gather with you. We got some gathering points. In fact... I wanted to let everybody know that our alpha classes, our alpha classes, which are our first uh, class into our newcomers, new converts, new membership course. If you wanted to be a part of the church, amen, or a member of a church, or you just want to know what we believe in when it comes to um, the Bible, <clears throat> amen. Uh, we're starting this coming Wednesday night at 7 p.m. We're, we are going to start. Brother Vladimir is going to be teaching that Alpha class. So he's excited. We're excited. Amen. He's nervous. And you don't have to be. Amen. Let him be nervous all, all that time. Amen. So um, this is also our baptismal class. So if you have never been baptized and would like to know, uh, you know, how we do that stuff, our baptismal service is going to be Mar uh, April 28th. So he's going to have our April 28th baptismal service. If you've never been baptized before. I think April 28th is going to be our baptismal service. It's going to be fantastic. So Brother Vladimir is going to, is a six-week course. Amen. Our beta class is going to be finished this coming Wednesday. We're starting our leadership classes. Amen. 21 Laws of Leadership next, when, not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday. So it's going to be, and I'm sorry, I'm doing all this announcement. That was not my point. Amen. But if you want to do, you want to get into what we're trying to do, amen, that would be uh, how to get started. Um, but anyway, it's, Going to be Easter Sunday, March 31st, 9.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. And this graph we showed last week, okay, the graph tells to us, um, people ask the question, do you plan on attending church services this coming Easter Sunday? And this was done by Gallup on 2002, 2005. Obviously, it's about the same. So most people, 64% 
in 2006 to 2% in 2005. Uh, I said they were going to come to Easter service, and, and that's a great time. And, and, and 31%, 37% said no. Uh, so, I mean, you got one out of three chances somebody will say yes to you. Amen. Three out of seven people. Uh, is that right? No, six out of ten people. Six out of ten people will say yes to you to go to service. And, and look at the statistics now. <clears throat> look at the statistic. 82%. They said, uh, of those that are invited, you all with me? More people, more people will likely go to church on Easter Sunday than any other time in the year. And it's just a fact, all right? In fact, there's a useful statistics. 82%, they said, of the unchurched are at least somewhat likely to attend church if invited, all right? 82% of the unchurched are at least somewhat likely to attend church if invited. And this was from a book, The Unchurched Next Door. And then another study, including more than 15,000 adults, revealed that about two-thirds are willing to receive information about a local church from a family member and 56% from a friend or neighbor. So the message is clear that the unchurched are open to conversations about church. Our church, we're wanting our church to be the uh, church for the unchurched. Amen. There's plenty of churches for ch people that have, um, that, that have church background. Amen. We want to be that church that the unchurched people like to go to. Amen. Whether it just be music, whether it just be inspirational preaching, whether it just be the people that are, they're hanging around with, we want to be that place. In fact, if you are here and you're not a believer in Jesus, I want to tell you, you are welcome here. We don't expect everybody to be here to be a believer in Jesus. We are. Most of us are. Uh, but we, we don't expect everybody to be here that is a believer in Jesus. In fact, if you are here and you're an atheist, we are just so proud of your courage. I mean, you, 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 man, we, we are, you're some courageous person, bro. Uh, and, and we're so glad that you are here. Uh, but even if you're in that capacity, you know what? You are welcome here and we love you. Amen. And we just want to show you love and, uh, and we just want to show you that we're good people and, and that uh, this is a great place to hang out with. Hang out. Now, even though the message is clear that the unchurched are open to conversations about the church, guess what? Only 2% of church members... Invite. Everybody say 2%. 2%. Of church members invite an unchurched person to church. 98% of churchgoers never extend an invitation in any given year. Wow. Uh, that's amazing. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Do you believe that statistic? Not us, right? No, everybody. But 98% of us invite somebody to church. I know. Now, this message, I'll tell you beforehand, uh, this is going to be one of those messages that you're going to feel guilty at the end of the message. I just wanted to let you know that that's not my intention, not to make you feel guilty. Uh, so that when you get to that place, you don't like, oh, man, look, Pastor Jones is making me feel guilty, so I have to do something. It's just the way I, I put it together. It's just the way it's going to come. And I, our church here, we don't ever want to make you feel uh, any way guilty. Now, we do want God to move in your heart. We want to share that. We want God to convict you. But we don't want you to do something out of compulsion. We want it to be real. We don't like fake around here. We want real. We want, uh, we want real concern and real desire. Okay, so uh, I'm going to tell you right now, you come to the point of the end of the service, you're going to be like, oh God, I feel guilty. I have to do something right now. But that's not my point. But it is going to give you a challenge. It is going to make you challenged. I know when I was putting it together and I was reading it, reviewing it, I felt uh, challenged myself. You know, so I wanted to make sure you don't feel like I'm trying to guilt you to do anything. Is that okay? Amen. All right. So listen, two percent of the church members invite an unchurched person to church. That is, that is terrible. Do you agree with me? Two percent only. That is terrible. And I think it comes from the fact that we're uncomfortable. We, we really are uncomfortable. We're, we're not comfortable talking to new people, uh, especially when it comes to church. Because there's an idea, there's a notion about church that you've got to know something to share something. Does that make sense? Or that in order for you to share something or in order for you to invite somebody to church, you've got to be perfect yourself. Have you ever felt that? 
Like you've got to be up to par in order for you to share. I, I know people I've talked to, I've talked to some of you guys and some of you folks, and you just share with me. You're just like, I just, you know what? I just, I just can't share it the way I'd like to because I know the way I am. Well, listen, I know you're uncomfortable, but we got to change that. All right. We've got to change that dynamic because it don't matter about who you are. It's about who he is. And it's about what we're doing here in this community of faith that really we want to present to people. Amen. And the great thing about this type of community is that we're not just about going to church on Sundays. We're not just about just attending church. We don't want people to just attend church. There's enough religious people around. We want people to build community. We want people to hang around us. We want people to get to know us. Amen. So it's not about just attending church. It's about getting together with people and letting them know who we are. So I know you're uncomfortable and I know you don't, you haven't done it, but anybody here has invited anyone to a party before? All right. Anybody here has ever invited anyone to a baby shower before? Have you ever invited anyone that you really didn't know, but you wanted them anyway, just because? Come on. You, have you anybody invited anyone to a football game before? Or anybody invited anyone to watch a movie before? Or anybody shared uh, shared you know one of the the the, the main the main uh, uh, shows that are going on now is like Once Upon a Time, you know that show. I don't know if anybody watches that, uh, but but Jennifer watches that, and I and and then you know I get dragged along to watch it, All right? Uh, you know, and, and people just talk about it. Just like, oh, have you seen that show before? You know what I'm talking about? So I know you're uncomfortable, but I want to share with you some, some scripture, okay? From the book of John chapter 4, verse 4 to 6. Now, he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria. We're talking about Jesus here called Sychar. Near the plot of the ground of Jacob and had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. Continue on. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan. How can you ask me for a drink? Okay, before we continue on, I... Uh, the Bible tells us the reason why this woman said, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. Why are you talking to me? Because historically back then, the Jews did not associate with Samaritans. There was a story or some type of historical uh, event that happened that the, 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 the Samaritans desecrated the Jewish temple by offering blood of some pagan, uh, pagan practice. And not only the Samaritans, the Samaritans were half-breeds. Half so they were partly Jews. So the Jews had nothing to do with Samaritans. They didn't want anything to do with these people from Samaria. But Jesus, the Bible said, he had to go to Samaria. Why? Because if you're traveling from one area of Jerusalem, or one area to Israel, to another area of Israel, it takes two days to go around Samaria. Okay? Most Jews travel around Samaria. They take those extra days. Now, back in the day, they didn't have a train. They didn't have any subway. They didn't have any car. And so they had to travel either by foot or by, 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 by fowl or by donkey or by horse. They went, literally went around Samaria so not to go into Samaria. But here's Jesus. He had to go through Samaria because I believe this woman, he had to meet this woman. So we continue on. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Okay? So this woman, get back, go back. <clears throat> this woman said, you're not supposed to talk to me. We're, we're Samaritans, you're a Jew. We're not supposed to talk to each other. And Jesus said, look, I don't care what we're supposed to not do and supposed to do. I got something for you. Because if you knew what I got for you, you wouldn't talk about our differences. See, I think a lot of us forget the fact that we've got something to offer. And we are so much about our differences that we forget and neglect what we have to offer. Amen? And we're so focused 
on what makes you a believer and what makes me a believer and what makes you a, a, a non-believer and what makes me go to church and what makes you not go to church, that we forget the ultimate thing is I have something to offer. And if you knew what I had to offer, we wouldn't be talking about the differences. And the thing about this, the Samaritan woman knew the difference. Jesus has an understanding about the need of the Samaritan. So to this Samaritan woman, it's about the difference between her and Jesus. But to Jesus, it's about what he can offer her. Are you getting what I'm talking about here? So Jesus had to go through Samaria, even though most Jews, if not all Jews, go around Samaria. Jesus went through Samaria not because of what the Samaritans and the Jews have differences. It was because of what he was to offer. Verse 27, the Bible says, just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked him, what do you want or why are you talking with her? And, and so the Jews, the Jewish disciples came to Jesus because Jesus had sent them to get some food. All right. And now the Samaritan woman comes to draw water from the well. And Jesus was at the well waiting for her. And all of a sudden, <clears throat> the, the woman, uh, Jesus speaks to her. And the woman have conversation with her. And now the Jewish disciples came and they were thinking, what in the world? Why is Jesus talking to this woman? This is so poignant for our time. This is so important for us. Because there are people that we are religiously taught not to talk to. There are people that and places that we religiously are taught not to go to. And if somebody finds you there, if somebody sees you talking to somebody, they might point a finger at you. Listen, I, I did something, and some of us did something we've never done before, all right? We went to a concert, all right, last Sunday. Yeah. You know, one of our, one of our brothers, Mike, he's, he's a beast in the drums. You, you've got it, right? Right, Omar? You, you, you were there. He's a beast in the drums. I mean, the guy is a double bass pedal <laughs> monster. Genius. All right? Now, when we went in there, it was B.B. King, so it was a big deal, you know. This was not just a little club or a little place in, in the city. This was B.B. King's right on 42nd Street near Dallas BBQ, and, and that was one of our reasons, you know. We're just like, we love Mike, you know. We, we're going to go there, but Dallas BBQ is right next door, you know. We're, we got two good reasons why we're going to the city today, right? So you don't blame me. Good. So... <clears throat> We went in there and, and, and you know, uh, everybody was doing one of those signs. All right? We're like, oh, God, you know, here we are, you know, grown up. I mean, that's, what is that? All right? That's the devil, a diablo, right? So I'm just like, oh, God, I'm all like, I'm all like, you know, I'm all, I'm all like nervous now. And the first man that was there, this is how they sound. <laughs> you got to see Danny's face. In fact, I took a picture of Danny's face. And I was like, dude, you're digging it. He was just like. <laughs> now, all Danny least listens to is worship music now. All he did, but back in the day, he doesn't, he didn't, when, before he didn't listen to worship music, he listened to R&B music, you know. This, this is what, way beyond our genre. Way beyond our genre. You know what I mean? Uh, but we were there not because of our desire for the music, so to speak, but we were there because one of our brothers were there. And we were there to support him for what he was doing in his journey of faith. And so we were there, and I was pacing around because the, the, the drummer of the other band was a beast too. So he was really good. So I'm like, oh, God, please, Mike, don't mess up, man. I'm like, God, Mike, you're going to mess up, dude. Oh, man, I'm so nervous. I'm pacing like, a, I'm pacing like an older brother, you know, that was concerned. Just like, oh, God, are you nervous too? Uh, yeah, I'm nervous. So, so Mike comes on. And, and lo and behold, the same thing. Blah, 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 blah. Great, great guitars, and we we're just amazed. And, and he did his thing, praise God. <clears throat> but could you imagine coming out of that if some, one, one of our uh, 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 traditionalist religious people come and they see us in that building? <laughs> They'd say, what do you want? <laughs> Why are you there? And we 
be like, we don't know either. No. <laughs> but like, no, we, we have to. There is a need for us to be there to support somebody, to talk to somebody, to be there with our brother. And there's just so much, you're welcome, bro. Uh, there's just so much to find this woman talking to you, and just a Samaritan woman. So Jesus, the disciples came and was like, what are you doing? So when the disciples came, she got all intimidated, and the Bible says in verse 28, then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Why? Because be, before, the, before the Jewish brethren came, before the apostles came, before the disciples came, Jesus was talking to her about her issues of life. You know, sometimes there is a point where God is dealing with somebody and then religious people, our religiosity comes and we lose sight of what it is that we're trying to talk to them about. We really got to watch it because the world is, is, is waiting for us at the well. Jesus told this woman, look, if you go to this well, you're going to have to come back because you're going to thirst again. But the well that I'm going to give you is springing up from within you. And you're never going to thirst again. In fact, it was so powerful for her. The message was so powerful for her. She intended to go and get water from the well. And she left her jar at the well site. I mean, she totally forgot why she came. Some of us are, in, are believers now. And we totally forgot the first time why we came to church. Just... Whatever it was, whether somebody invited you to for, for lunch afterwards or somebody invited you to do something or, or you, were, you, you just came because your friend was here, whatever it was, you, now you just kind of like, you know what? There is something here that I never thought existed before. And if you're here, you've never experienced that, you know, just hang around a little bit if, if you're not planning already how to get out of here. So, so this woman, obviously, I've, I've heard about the Messiah. She went to the whole town and told everybody about this one that she was speaking to. In verse 40. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. I, I want to share with us that sometimes it's not even about the person you're talking to. It's about the people she will talk to. That sometimes we're talking to somebody and we think, yeah, we, we, we understand that. But that, that person has the capacity to bring others with them. Yeah. That the message that you're sharing with them is not necessarily just for them. It's, it's for other people as well. Last Sunday we had, I mean, one of the, the most, the, the message I preached last Sunday was so well received. That, you know, from, from, from the first time guest. To those that have been in the church for a long time, just was like, you know, the, the first time guest crying and the long time, the long time member saying, where's the CD? I need the CD. I need to hear it again. And unfortunately, it wasn't recorded like that. But something clicked in me last week. From the book of Isaiah chapter 61, Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord, Jesus had quoted the scripture. Isaiah said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to proclaim the good news. And I realized that Jesus came not for the purposes that we thought he came. That he was anointed not to create a religious movement. He was anointed not to be a, a Christian, not to create Christianity. He was anointed to proclaim good news. That was his purpose. I mean, we come together now as a church, as a community of faith, and we think, well, this is our purpose, to gather together, to sit down, hear a message, worship, worship sing a song, so forth and so on. But the real, the real mission of the follower of Jesus is to continue the anointing that was on Jesus Christ, which is to proclaim the good news, to bind the broken, to heal to men, to, 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 to turn beauty, uh, for, to turn ashes into beauty, and to turn joy, to turn mourning into joy. That that was his purpose, and that was his mission. Listen, we, we, we come to church, and we sit here, and we get comfortable in here, and we don't do anything uncomfortable, because we are thinking now that this is what Christianity is all about. See, you could be a believer, but there's a lot of people that are not followers of Jesus. 
I dare say that most of the people here in this building are believers in Jesus, but not many of us are followers of Jesus. Because Jesus, now, the, the, the key thing that, that, that I wanted to, to present to us is that Jesus went out of his way to go to Samaria just to talk to this woman because this woman was connected to the whole city. And the Bible says in verse 42, continue on, let's look at verse 42. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. See, Jesus went out of his way to talk to this one woman because there are people that need to hear the message. In our beta class, we're talking about the Holy Spirit. And before I went through all the litany of all the scriptures that we had in our study, uh, our study sheet, I had to create a premise that the Holy Spirit did not come just to make you talk in tongues. That the Holy Spirit did not come just to seal you and to give you a gift and to do all this stuff. The Holy Spirit has come to anoint you to do what Jesus was doing. The Holy Spirit came so that you can be a better imitator of Christ. And the reason why we gather here together is not so that we can hear me speak or that we can hear the worship team speak. So that we can learn how to be more like him. And the reason why we say, Lord, I want more of you, it's not because we are just here so that we can, we can just lay at his bosom and, and hear his heartbeat. No, to hear his heartbeat is to do what he was called and sent out to do. John the Beloved, who laid at the bosom of Jesus, was the same one that was traditionally has known historically to have been boiled in oil in the island of Patmos. He had given his life and his body so that he could continue the work of Calvary. Growing up in a Pentecostal home, in a Pentecostal church, I, th I thought the only th reason for the Holy Spirit is so that I could speak in a language I've never spoken before. So I could lay hands on the sick and they can, they can be healed. So that I can cast out demons and they could get out. So that I can, I can show the power of God and I can feel goosebumps and lay people out. But no, that's not what it's all about. It's all nice. Those are all well and good. But that's not what it's all about. What it's all about is that you can be Jesus in the world. And if you're, if, if you're a spirit-filled believer here, I want to tell you, you are not spirit-filled so that you can come on Sunday and fill these pews. You are spirit-filled so that you can be Jesus out at work, so that you can be Jesus out in the library. So if people go there anymore, but and so that you can be Jesus out in the coffee house. You can be Jesus at the Starbucks. That's what the Holy Spirit is for. Yes, the Holy Spirit is for a seal. Yes, it's for salvation. Yes, it's so that we can be resurrected and meet Jesus in the air. The same Spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the body shall also raise your mortal body and turn it incorruptible. That's what the book of Romans says. That's what Paul the Apostle says. And if I'm going too fast, please just tell me you're doing it again. <laughs> All right? Yes, it's all of that. It's the resurrection power of Jesus Christ so that we can rise again from the dead. But listen, it's not about the dying Christian the Holy Spirit is about. It's about the living Christian that the Holy Spirit is about. It's about the living Christian. And so this is what I say to us. Get uncomfortable. You know what Jesus did? If you, don't, if you don't believe what I'm about to tell you, it's okay. We understand. But as a believer, I believe that God robed himself in the flesh. I, I, I know, I know what the pundits are saying. Prove it. I, I can't. <laughs> it's just a matter of faith. And the more I, the more I, I read, the more, the more I, I, I'm in the community, and the more I do it, the more I realize it's true. But if you're here, you don't believe that, you don't have to. Okay, but I believe it. All right? And if you're a believer, you need to hear this. Jesus robed himself in the flesh. Okay? If he was God, he had everything in his power. But he got uncomfortable because he needed to be where the need was. What is God? And, or rather, who is God if he's not mindful of our needs? Heaven touched earth because you and I have a need. 
you know why people have distaste for Christianity and religiousness? It's because they don't hear the Jesus of the Bible. You know what they hear? The Jesus of the church. And this Jesus of, of, of the person that has a sign up, repent, because he's coming soon. Like, are you kidding me? He's my father? What? Are you, are you telling me? I have to, his coming soon is a dread to us. But it should not be. It should be a joy to hear that our father is coming back for us. But because we are so, we have been taught about this judgmental, this fire and brimstone Jesus, that this is what the unchurch hear. But let me tell you, if you are an unchurched, if you don't believe that, I want to tell you something. And I, this is what I believe. That God robed himself in the flesh because he wanted to know where and what your pains were. That the greatest part about God robing in flesh is that his greatest time is his death on the cross. That he became famous for his death. Why? Because when he died, he rose again. That means every single one of us has the ability to die and rise again. So that you and I are not stuck being in a down state. But we have the right and the ability by the grace of God to rise again. But you know what Jesus did? He left all his glory. He left everything on, in heaven and came down. And where was he born? In a manger. Where did he grow up? In Nazareth. What was he? A son of. A carpenter. There was no good thing, so to speak, that we can find in him. But you know why he did that? So that he could connect with the destitute. He could connect with the broken. He could connect with those that do not know him. Listen, I'm trying to get us to a point where we truly are changed on the inside. And understand, it's not about just going into a building. It's about being Jesus out in the world. Listen, the world don't need any more Christians. The world needs Jesus. Really do. And I've realized, Sister Wanda, I realize we need the Holy Spirit in our lives. We need the power of God to reign in our hearts. We need more prayer. We need more Bible study. We need more time together. Why? Not to be more religious. To be, to, to learn and become more like Him. More like Jesus. I need all the Jesus I can get. I need every Jesus I can get because I am not good on my own. Listen, if you put me in a room and you take something from me, I want that something back. But Jesus says, I'm in the room so that you can take something from me. I came not to take. In fact, the word of God said Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. But to serve. Are you all here with me? I got another story here. This is, this is, this is the Samaritan story. Luke chapter 10, verse 30. The Bible says, in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he's attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Continue on. And a priest, everybody say priest. That's a good guy. Okay, for those of you that don't know a priest is, that's a good guy. <laughs> Happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Everybody say other side. <laughs> so to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. And if you don't know anything about priests, well, you, you probably have a little clue about priests. Priests are those people that do stuff in the temple. And the Levite, by, herit by her uh, heritage and by pedigree, he is a son of Aaron. Aaron was the high priest of God in the Old Testament. So all his sons were the high priest. So you got a priest, you got a minister of the, of the church, so to speak, and then you got the main guy, the pastor or the bishop. They see this this man that was being, go, go back, verse 30, go back, verse 30. Look, look, look what they said. 
A man was going down from Jerusalem, Jericho, when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving half dead. So there's a man on the side of the road, half dead. Stripped of his clothes. Okay, you could obviously see he was attacked by robbers. In verse 31. And a religious person came. And a church person came. And a minister came. Going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite. He came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. I'm not going to get myself uncomfortable. Uh, you know, uh, studying this. There are some things that we've got to learn about the priests and the Levites. Okay. Number one, the priests and the Levites are called, but in the New Old Testament, not to touch a dead person. So it was by mandate they did not touch anybody dead. So when they saw him, religion came over them. And the law came over them and said, I can't touch him. He is dead or dying. So they went around him. Maybe a religious compulsion. Right? But verse 33 says, but a Samaritan, here's a Samaritan again. Jesus is just out to just just shake people's thinking back then. Because the Jews did not do anything, did not do with Samaritans. They, they did not hang out with Samaritans. And so Jesus could have just said any other person, could have just been a regular person, a normal person. No, he had to choose a Samaritan. He had to choose somebody that nobody liked. Now Jesus was talking to the Jews, so everybody understood. So when Jesus said Samaritan, all the Jews were like, what's, what's so good about a Samaritan? What is he going to do? They're probably leaning in going, all right, I want to hear what the Samaritan did. Probably beat him and kicked him in the face, probably continued on. But here, Jesus put the Samaritan and he said, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him and he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. Listen to me. Listen to me, church, Christian, Christian follower of Jesus. And I'm telling you, this is already, uh, I told you this may make you feel guilty a little bit. That's not my intention, but I need to challenge everybody here. There are Samaritans out there who are not believers in Jesus, or not followers of Jesus, who are other religious faiths that are helping people. And we walk around and we think, oh, I'm all good and bad. I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. Shut up and sit down because somebody that is an atheist is helping somebody else. Somebody that don't know Jesus is helping somebody else. I saw this man. I saw this video the other day, and I saw this years ago. I saw this years ago or maybe a year or so ago about this man that graduated as an engineer or some type of a high degree in, in India. Have you seen this one? You've seen this one. I'm, I'm sure you've seen this one. If not, I'll put it on our Facebook webpage, facebook.com forward slash worship and preach CC. Amen. That's the plug. Anyway, there's a man that he graduated and he went to his village and he see all these people dying from hunger. Right? And I'm sure I'm not going to tell this story properly. I'm I'll just put it up next week. All right. You all know this story. All right? he died from hunger. The man decided, I'm going to go and do something about it. The short story here is that he quit his job, high-paying job. And every day he'd feed the untouchables of India. But in a sense, he goes, but humanity is humanity. And there's no difference between them and I. And I'm thinking, man, I wish he would say, I'm Brahmin, but I met Jesus Christ. And Jesus showed me that I have to go and help out. No, he didn't say that. He said, it was not my culture. It was not my religion that made me do this. I'm a human being. 
And we walk around, really, I, I'm, I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying, because God is, is operating me to make us from just churchgoers, believers, to followers of Jesus. What would happen if the 50 or 60 of us here would go out and be like Jesus and get ourselves uncomfortable? Listen. But Samaritan, as he traveled, he poured out the man his own donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day, he took two denarii or some type of money and gave them to the innkeeper and looked after him and said, when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told them, go and do likewise. We have our excuses. We have our reasons why we're not inviting somebody to come to know the Lord. We have our reasons, our excuses, why we don't go out of our comfort places to reach somebody that needs, needs help. We, are, we were so privileged that our church, God used our building so that we can be, uh, God used our building so that we can be a, a, a resource to our community when Sandy hit. Right? And when Sandy hit, we were able to go and share our, our light, share our heat, share our coffee, share all this stuff. And all these thousands of pounds that came through uh, of food and supplies that came through this building for us. And Danny and I were talking about it last night as we left this building. And we were talking about the fact that, the, the, that he was saying that uh, he's go, I'm just so thankful that God allowed me to go through certain things. Because all the religious stuff that I had in my mind, I had to devalue. And I said, you know what, Dan? What's so great about, and it's, it's strange to say that, but what's so great about what, what happened in Sandy was that everything that God was telling me in my heart, I was able to experiment in the people that he wanted me to reach. One of the things that God, God was sharing with me is just do and shut up. Just do. Let the Jesus in you be so great that you don't have to tell about the Jesus that you know. That the Jesus that's resident in your life, that's true and real and active in your life, does not have to be spoken about. And they will want to know what it was about you that makes you different. Amen. And, and some of our new members can tell us here, and they're not new anymore, five months later they're here. Amen. So some of our, some of our newer members can tell you that when we, when we were at Sandy, I didn't talk to them about the church. I didn't tell them when we had service. In fact, that time, we had 23 baptisms December 9th. And that was all from that semi-religious experiment that I was saying, God, you're going to do your work. All I have to do is be the vessel and get uncomfortable. And if I have to spend 12, 16 hours a day in, in a building meeting people that I've never met and feeding them and giving them love like they were family members, like, like I owed them something. You, you listen, people came to me as though I was giving something to them like gold or something. And, and even until now, I'd go to the corner store and they'd all still be talking about us. And I'm just thinking, no, no, it's not us. We just got the opportunity to do it. Anybody would do it. And I'm trying to downplay it. But they're like, you did good. You you did good. You did good. You did good. And I'm lifting up my hands and I'm saying, God, thank you. You did good. You did good. You did good. You did good. Because guess what? Guess what? If it was left up to old priest, if it was left up to old Levite, I would have passed around. I would have stayed in my house in Port Richmond and go poor South Beach. Somebody ought to do something. Amen. I'm almost done. I want to, Dr. King, Martin Luther King Jr., one of my American heroes. You don't have to be black to like him. Love that man. 
In his I have been to the mountaintop speech, he says, I remember when Mrs. King and I were first in Jerusalem. We rented a car and drove from Jerusalem down to Jericho. And as soon as we got on that road, I said to my wife, I can see why Jesus used this as the setting for his parable. Continue on. It's a winding, meandering road. It's really conducive for ambushing. You start out in Jerusalem, which is about 1,200 miles or rather 1,200 feet above. And, 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 and Wikipedia corrected him. It's about 2,100 feet. Continue on. And by the time you get down to Jericho, 15 or 20 minutes later, you're about 22 feet below sea level. Actually, 846. So you go from 2,100 to a drop of 800 feet. That's dangerous road. In the days of Jesus, it came to be known as the bloody pass. Continue on. Why? If you know it, it's possible that the priest and the Levite looked over that man on the ground and wondered if the robbers were still around. Because they might have been, and continue on. Or is it possible that they felt that the man on the ground was merely faking? <laughs> That's a lot of our excuse. He's faking. That's not a real need. And he was acting like he had been robbed and hurt in order to seize them over there, to lure them for quick and easy seizure. Listen, that is so plausible, right? We've heard it before. I mean, there's posts about it. If a kid is crying in the corner and ask you to bring him to a certain address, bring him the police instead because he might be luring you for a trap, right? Isn't that possible? But look at what, what Martin Luther King continued to say. Right? And so the first question that the priest asked, the first question that the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But look what he continued on. But then the good Samaritan came by and reversed the question, if I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? And a lot of us don't invite people. 2% of us only invite. 98% of us don't invite anybody to a community of gathering or to a community meeting or to some type of a gathering here in the church because we're thinking, what will happen to me? If I get uncomfortable, what would happen to me? What would happen to me? If I talk to somebody who's not, who didn't have the same lifestyle as I do, who, has, who does not have the same uh, uh, sexual orientation that I do, that don't have the same religious beliefs that I do, that don't have the same traditions that I do, what will happen to me? If, if I allow people to come into my house that, that, that is in need, what would happen to my house? If I allow these people to come into the church, what will happen to the church? The question is not about what will happen to me. It's what will happen to him. If I pass him over, he just may die. Get uncomfortable. Go out of your way. In fact, some of them are in your way. Some of them are right in front of your face and you're walking around them. You have a chance like that Samaritan woman to not only affect one life, we have a chance to affect hundreds of lives. Like I told Sunday, last Wednesday night, if you talk to 10,000 people and you saved one woman from jumping out of her window, was 10,000 worth conversation for one life? If 1,000 people thought you were nuts for being a believer and one person gave their life to Jesus, and the whole family comes to know God. 
was, were those 999 people that thought you were nuts, is that worth that one person? When you're talking to your coworkers and your coworker is about to break down, you don't know their story. And you don't know what's going on in their lives. And you don't know what's happening at the home. And you don't know the financial situations that are happening. But you're talking to people about a God that loves them. About a community of faith that wants to help them. About, a, about friends and family here in the church that will embrace them. And you may think, you know what, everybody has it. No, 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 not everybody has family. Not everybody has 50 people that will love them. There are people that don't even have five friends. But you don't know who they are. You don't know their story. You don't know if they're faking on the side of the road dying or they're just there for real. And you may think, what's going to happen to me if I extend myself and get myself uncomfortable? I told you, I don't mean to be, make this guilty, but the, I have to challenge you. It, it, because you know what? You have, you have probably the greatest chance to share somebody this hope and this news that there is a better way and there's a better life. And somebody could change their life because of this news by you sharing it with somebody. And I don't know, maybe 10 out of, uh, 3 out of 10 people would say no to you. And maybe more people will say no to you but there's a chance that somebody yes. somebody whether you're professional well educated or you're a poor person that don't never went to school do you know that there are people that kill themselves with millions of dollars and there are people that only have one dollar and trying to make it work every day. But 98% of it is saying, what would happen to me? I want us to stand. You got to do something with this message, folks. I told you it's going to be a little heavy, right? I warned you. And I know our flyer says you have to for the person that's reading it. But for you, as a believer, as a follower of Jesus, you have to. What if we change the, the dynamics, bro, the percentages? What if instead of 2% of people are the only ones that are inviting people, 98% of us are inviting somebody constantly? Somebody said it on a Wednesday night. If there's 56 of us here and you just invite one person to come, maybe you invite 10 and one of them come. We'd be 112 here next week. And if we, can imp if we can bring the thought of this message to other people, 112 could be 224 by Easter Sunday. Hey, listen. There's a Samaritan on a well waiting to hear good news. There's a man that's been beaten and robbed and dying on the side of the road that needs the good news. And you may think, I haven't seen one of those lately, Pastor Jones, because if I've seen a dead man or I've seen a man beaten down there, I would certainly help him. Uh, not the way statistics go. Have you seen that video of the queen, the woman in Queen's Hospital? She was on her face dying, and even the nurses were passing her by. You heard about the 911 call? A woman was dying in the cafeteria or the, the rec room of an independent living place. And the nurse was on the phone talking to 911. And 911 says, Why don't you do CPR? She said, I can't. 
because policy dictated me not to do CPR. And the 911 personnel says, please, is there any human being there? This woman is going to die if nobody does the CPR on her. Is there any passerby? Is there anybody you can talk to? Anybody? Put me on the phone with anybody, please. And the woman is on the phone. I'm sorry, there's nobody here. And the woman later died in the hospital. She said, anybody know how to do CPR? Anybody know how to do CPR? She said, yes, I'm a nurse. You're a nurse. You're a follower of Jesus. You know the gospel. You know what it's done for you. You know the message of hope that has changed your life. And somebody is dying. Somebody is dying. Can anybody, for humanity's sake, you found a good thing. For humanity's sake, tell somebody. Father, I made it very heavy today. I don't think I've preached this type of heaviness in a long time. Father, if people feel guilty, I, I'm sorry for that. But for those of us, that your conviction is falling on us. Because we have neglected our co-workers. Because we haven't made our way out of our homes to knock on a door or to a neighbor. We haven't said hello to anybody brand new in the past two years. And we just stayed in our New York state of mind that as long as they don't touch me, I don't touch them. Father, we are not citizens of New York. We are citizens of heaven. We're a different mandate, God. Father, move upon us, Lord Jesus. God, help us. <laughs> Pray, O oh God, that this message doesn't go over anybody's head. It'll go directly to our hearts. And the words of Martin Luther King would resonate into our heart. It's not about what will happen to me. If I don't do anything, what will happen to him? What will happen to them? If you're here and you're feeling God speak to you, maybe this is more than just, just the heaviness, but maybe you're feeling God calling you for some type of ministry, some type, maybe God is telling you, hey, you need to go and, and volunteer at a homeless shelter. Or maybe God is telling you, you need to give some, some money and some funds. Maybe God is, 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 is calling you to do Whatever it is, I want to invite you to come to the front. And let's just talk to the Lord for just a minute. Father, I want to respond to this message, God. I want to respond to this message, the Lord Jesus, with something. I want to, God, do something out of the ordinary. Shake me out of my comfort zone, God. Shake me out of my comfort zone.
Why don't you read somebody? Why don't you? Can you? Would you mind if you don't? If you're uncomfortable with it, I understand. But can you reach over to somebody? And let's just pray for someone right now. Salise. Use anything, Lord. You can use me. You can use anything, Lord. You can use me. You can use anything, Lord. You can use me. Take my hands, Lord. Take Hi, guys. There's some people here praying. If you want to pray for somebody, won't you come? Let's lay hands on our brothers here. Just extend our hands. Hallelujah. Reach out to somebody. Go ahead. Pray with them. You can use anything, Lord. You can use. That's it. Everybody in this building, find somebody else. Touch my heart. Let's get a little comfortable, uncomfortable here. You can use anything, Lord. You can use me. You can use anything, Lord. You can use me. You can use anything, Lord. You can use me. Lord, speak to me. You can use anything, Lord. You can use me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Use me, for your glory. You can use anything, Lord. You can use me. Touch my heart, Lord, speak to me. You can use anything, Lord, you can use me. You can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Hallelujah. You can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take my hands, Lord, take Somebody. Hey, if you know somebody today, be your phone, a phone number. Maybe they're not here today. Why don't you reach out to somebody today and say, look, I was just I was just thinking about you. Just wanted to let you know I care about you. I want to let you know that I love you. I want to let you know. I want to let you know if you're hurting. You don't have to hurt alone. Can we do that? Can you find a phone number someplace? Maybe you have to go to a neighbor or something.
There's still plenty of people that are suffering here in Staten Island and elsewhere. Let's not pass on by. pray that we've all been touched by the word of the Lord today. Amen. It's a heavy word. It's a powerful word, but it's one that we need. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. Uh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. If the word of the Lord touch you today, amen. Act on it. Amen. Act on it before it all of a sudden dies out and you have no passion for it again. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. You may all be seated for a moment. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We're going to receive our tithes and our offering as Brother Ben is passing out the tithing envelopes. I just have a few announcements. Amen. Men's prayer meeting is tomorrow night. That's from 6 to 7 p.m. We have Tuesday night prayer meetings from 7 to 8.30 here. Amen. And we start our Alpha classes this Wednesday, 7 to 8 p.m. For those of you that are new, for those of you that are new members of the church, I've never taken the class. Uh, you're invited to be here Wednesday, 7 to 8 uh, we also have Story Slam, which is the story of the Bible, but the Mark is going through it. Amen. Thursdays at 8 p.m. Amen. Um, we also have Youth Group. Amen. Which Brother Danny is heading. Amen. They will be meeting here on Fridays from 7, uh, Fridays from 7 p.m. I'm not sure what time they end, but be here at 7 p.m. if you're interested. Amen. And also the women meet on Fridays from 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. Amen. For more information, see Sister Jennifer. Um, this coming Saturday, the women are going to be uh, bowling. Amen. At Rob's Lane. Amen. At 2 p.m. See Sister Jennifer, if you're interested. It's $13 per person. Amen. If you would all stand, we're going to receive our tithes and our offerings right now. Amen. We're going to pray. If you are here for the first time,